my name is Milos Dunic. I work for TD Bank. Uh, I lead payments, technology delivery, and innovation. Uh, I'm Anthony Nguyen. I'm the, the development manager of the payments innovation team at TD Bank. Yep. So uh, we're extremely happy and privileged uh, to have the opportunity to participate as speakers and presenters at uh, biggest Canadian payments conference. Um, we thank to the organizers for including us into the program. We believe that what we will show you is educational and fun at the same time. And hopefully it will show you the uh, power of AI, what it can do, and also some lessons learned uh, in terms of what it cannot do, what is not realistic to expect from technology like this, at least uh, in today's time. Uh, thank you all for sacrificing your lunch time and being here because uh, all we can offer you is not food, not sandwiches. It is really just uh, a nice presentation and nice, nice time. So <clears throat> as part of our payments innovation journey, we have uh, explored AI as a technology, as many of other innovation teams and delivery teams in every major bank in the world do. Uh, we have also explored potential of machine learning, how we can use it and how, how we can prepare the organization and ourselves as, as employees and participants in the whole game uh, prepare us when open banking, when everything else, rich data comes along, how we can basically process that data. But in order to learn the, learn the technology and learn its limitations and understand it uh, well, we had charged our payments innovation team with a little fun assignment. <coughs> and uh, we asked them, how can they use machine learning and AI to count uh, Canadian cash in front of phone's camera. So what they come up, came up with uh, is nothing short of amazing, and you will see it a little bit later. So how machines learn? Machines really are stupid. They're not, they're, they're, they're actually a million times more stupid than the newborn baby which has nothing in, in their brain. So we need to teach the computer. We need to help the computer. And as I have rehearsed this presentation a couple of times uh, in the last couple of days over the weekend with a professional from TD, uh, from the marketing department, and uh, not even I could be taught to not improvise. So I, I told her, you can try to train me and uh, put me into some kind of uh, a box, but I'm gonna improvise. I can't present uh, without improvising. So if I make mistake, you're, you're more than free to laugh. Um, how machines learn? So machines, as I said, they're stupid and we need to help them learn. What we need to do uh, for the machine is prepare a lot of teaching data, a lot of training data. That data needs to be somehow labeled and somehow uh, marked so that the machine, when it sees the data and it tries to do some kind of prediction, the machine knows how to evaluate the error of that prediction and then try to readjust its parameters of the model that's within the, uh, behind the machine learning uh, system or solution, how to readjust those parameters so that the next try is a little bit more successful. And the training process, regardless of uh, the type of underlying uh, machine learning model, is always the same. So you need to prepare the data, you need to present the data to the, to the model. Model tries to make a prediction, makes a guess, makes a mistake. 
usually makes a mistake, especially in early phases. And then it needs to be able to measure the amount or magnitude of its mistake. And then if, if mistake is above certain threshold, machine readjusts its parameters and it tries again. So that is basically this triangle uh, depicting the uh, payments or machine learning uh, process in, in almost every uh, scenario. So you, that's, that's basically a universal uh, cycle of supervised machine learning. There are other types of machine learning, but they're not applicable in here, and I don't have time to, to go into those. So the, oops. One type of machine learning model, underlying model, is neural network. How many of you actually know what neural network is and hopefully where is this used, how, how does it work, what, what does it represent? Can, okay, not many, but this is even more useful then. So, so uh, neural network is a system of artificial uh, neurons, although I, I disagree with that. They're, they're not really neurons but I call them e-neurons. <coughs> They're stacked in multiple layers. So you have the input layer, which basically represents the uh, input data. You have intermediate layers called hidden layers, which are trying to learn something about that particular domain and, and embed that knowledge within, its, uh, within, within the connections between those neurons in different layers. And you have usually the output layer, which is either uh, in, in neural network case, it's most likely a classification uh, type uh, decision point. And uh, there are different types of neural networks. There are uh, neural networks that are fully connected, where each e neuron is fully connected to uh, each of the previous uh, e neurons and all those connections have weights. Those weights are actually the parameters of the model that could be adjusted. And they are adjusted, and each of the neurons has some kind of built-in function based on the sum of, of the inputs that are coming into that ne particular neuron. It either triggers or doesn't trigger the output for the next layer of neurons. Convolutional neural networks are optimized neural networks for, for uh, image processing, and uh, that is the one that we will focus on today. Oops, wrong button. So why, why do we have uh, convolutional neural networks and how they work? When you have, if you try to use fully connected neural network to do image recognition or object recognition or object classification or for any type of a little bit more complex and uh, data in intensive uh, problem domain, uh, you run into a scalability issue because there is so many connections, like it, it, it just grows exponentially uh, between different uh, layers of the neural network. That's why convolutional neural networks have been introduced and invented, and they introduce two operations that reduce, uh, reduce the number of connections to deal with, number of weights, without sacrificing the accuracy and ability of, of the model. And those two operations are convolution. Convolution is actually, uh, if you have an image, uh, five by five pixels, and you have then you apply a series of filters, and you slide those filters through the image, and each nine pixels, you basically scale down to <coughs> one value, to one neuron. So it, it, it can also, like, like, by order of magnitude, you, you can reduce number of neurons to deal with and number of weights to, to train. 
Uh, another operation that is very useful and usually combined together with, with uh, convolution is pooling. Pooling then takes product of the convolution and reduces it further down in number of connections and neurons and ways to deal with. So, and convolutional neural networks are almost exclusively used for object rec recognition, object classification, and they just different in their methodology, how they learn, how they structure those uh, hidden layers, convolutional layers and pooling layers, in which sequence, how many of them there are, and what, is the, what are the factors for uh, convolution and, and max pooling. So uh, at the end of convolutional neural network is then uh, several layers of fully connected uh, e-neuron, electronic neurons, which do the final classification of, uh, of whatever uh, neural network was trying to do. Oops, again, wrong button. So object detection is a process where we try, like much simpler problem to deal with is classification. So when neural network is presented with the image, it just needs to tell what, is, what type of object is on the image. It doesn't need to tell where in the image that object is actually located while object detection is a little bit more complex problem and it requires to locate the, the object and then determine the type of the object within the picture. And you can see the difference between the two. Classic object detectors used classifiers. They slid them through, through the image and tried to detect the object that way. They were slow. Then uh, other more advanced types like region convolutional neural networks were introduced, which try to uh, first determine where potential objects are, and then do classification on, on within just those regions. What does YOLO mean to you guys? Has anybody heard? the term YOLO? That's true. That's right. So YOLO, to most of the people, YOLO means you only live once. And it became popular with the all social networking, uh, graffiti community, rap musicians, and actually Canadian rapper Drake is credited for making the YOLO acronym part of the mainstream lingo and popularizing it through, the, through his songs. He also was very much involved in, uh, in trying to acquire the rights for the term because uh, he, he, he was involved in some merchandise in some uh, American uh, chain store. However, he was not successful and he doesn't own the trademark to that uh, acronym. For the rest of us, like Anthony and myself, machine learning geeks, uh, YOLO means you only look once. You look at the image. So YOLO is the real-time convolutional neural network that tries to detect where on the image the object is and what type of object by just looking once at the image. And we were intrigued by that whole promise and we tried to test it. So we put YOLO to the test and you will see uh, the result uh, of that. So YOLO convolutional ne neural network uh, architecture is something like this. You have an input layer which is 448 by 448 pixel image that is presented to the model. And you have like 24 different convolutional neural, uh, convolutional layers and a max pooling layers. And at the end, you have uh, like uh, 20 uh, fully connected 
uh, layers which are doing final classification of what is actually in, the, in each of the bounding boxes you will see. So secret of, of YOLO and promise of YOLO is that it unifies all of the knowledge from all of the previous object detection uh, models into very efficient model. And no, uh, like this model has been used in uh, self-driven cars and stuff like that because it's real time. It actually, if it's ran on a powerful computer, not GPU, but if it's ran on the power, powerful computer, it can process actually 45 frames per second, which is amazing. It's, it's really good. So how YOLO works? It actually divides the picture into a grid. And then each cell on the grid is trying to figure out, is, is there center of an object within my boundaries? If there is, basically then, it is responsible for detecting that object later down the road. And also, uh, so in our experiment, uh, we put uh, grid uh, to a value of 13. So we have all of, all of our images are divided into 13 by 13 uh, cells by YOLO, not by us. YOLO, we just needed to configure YOLO. And then YOLO tries, after that, YOLO tries to determine where potential bounding boxes that surround, that bound the, the object. YOLO still doesn't know what that object is, but YOLO feels, based on the previous learning, that something is inside and tries to uh, determine the size of that box and center of that box. And then, after, uh, that it basically provides, YOLO provides to the programmer uh, 13 by 13 uh, by whatever, 5 and 13 by 13 by 6 values, predictions. And based on the threshold that we set, we say, okay, if the confidence of YOLO model is above 70%, that within the region you have a bounding box and some kind of, a, of object, we take that into account. So it is then final prediction. YOLO basically gives you everything on the left-hand side as its output. Like it, it gives you 13 by 13 by five bounding box predictions. It's, it tells you, I think something is here with this accuracy. I think something is here with this accuracy. And then you take the highest confidence bounding boxes and basically then you work only with those. Then we also have within each of the box, we have 13 by 13 by six object class predictions. In our case, we have only six types of objects, six type of Canadian coins. What we did here is we gave to the team a YOLO model that was pre-trained on something called Pascal image set. And it contains like, I, I believe like 40 uh, types of objects, bicycles, motorcycles, cars, traffic lights, traffic uh, signs, uh, road signs and stuff like that. Cats, dogs, animals. So we took that model and we said, okay, can we retrain it with a different training set so that it, in the end, recognizes only Canadian coins? And you will see the results again. What I have to say is that has been done without changing a single line of code in the YOLO model code. So we just took the YOLO which was pre-trained for totally irrelevant set of objects for financial industry. And we said, okay, can we retrain it to recognize Canadian coins? We tried to include bills, but then we needed a lot more pictures and a lot more training data. And we gave up. That would probably be the next phase. 
how we trained YOLO. So we prepared the data. We had, we have luxury in our payments innovation team. Anthony actually works with a lot of uh, bright kids from University of Waterloo. Uh, and we use them. They're, I don't want to say cheap labor, but uh, <laughs> they're enthusiastic and not very expensive. So we can, we have luxury to, uh, to use them as our uh, smart uh, team to create input data to, to cleanse it and to prepare it. So what they did, they did, they took hundreds of pictures for each coin type, they labeled them, they uh, drew boxes around each, each image, and then we did the training of the model. So preparation of the data, this is a little bit detailed. So we, we YOLO requires for each type of object that you want to, rec to be able to recognize, it requires minimum of 300 of photographs or, or images. Uh, what we've done is we asked the kids to do it at, under different angles, lighting conditions, uh, uh, heights of the camera, and stuff like that, like different, different positions and rotations of the coin. Because it, it is like machine learning is very labor, laborious process. And I, that's one of the lessons learned. Uh, so we had to consider angles, lighting conditions, all kinds of different environmental uh, impacts on the image in real life to, to train the, the YOLO to be able to deal with all those nuances in, in real life situations. Then uh, they used Microsoft uh, Visual Object Targeting Tool, tagging tool, to draw boxes, label it, and prepare all of the data. Then Anthony brought a couple of his Bitcoin mining uh, GPUs, and we plugged them into a couple of our servers, we used it for training uh, of the YOLO. We then presented all those images, labeled images as training data and made sure that the uh, error for prediction drops below a, an acceptable threshold. I don't know what, what did we say, like mm, I don't know, yeah. <laughs> whatever. Uh, and this is the GPU that we had used. Luckily, uh, Anthony was able to lend us his own. Uh, and all we needed to do is we wrote a Python script to basically keep presenting and measuring the, the error, uh, prediction error uh, amplitude and stop the process when that error amplitude basically drops below acceptable level. So using the app, using the app is very simple. You, uh, app has control of, of your camera. You basically just start the app, turn on the camera and point it to a uh, bunch of coins and app basically recognizes them automatically labels them in real time and sums them up, gives you a total of the money that you have in, within the visual uh, view of the camera. So maybe Anthony can right. show you what okay. he and those kids did. By the way, a couple of those kids are younger than my old Subaru. <laughs> so I just, like two months ago, I was sad to dispose of my 21-year-old Subaru. A couple of kids on, on the team are actually 19 years old, and they, they did all these amazing jobs. Hmm. All right, uh, so here we have the uh, our modified uh, TD app. Uh, I'll just like open up. We call it TD Clink. <laughs> so I'll set the TD Clink functionality here, TD Clink, and I'll just tap that Clink. <laughs> Uh, so here we have the app. Um, so what's the best, exci most exciting way to show this? Okay. Ooh, okay. So yeah, it's just like 
just put like a coin into into the screen and it will like oh, let's see twenty five like you can like I can't even tell well I mean yeah so it does pretty well under bright bright light like I can't even tell that's twenty five but it's like it knows <laughs> like it's five and it also like adds up the total as well uh, so let's try give it a challenge maybe so five ten. <laughs> Uh, we haven't trained it with a, a like a foreign yeah, currency yet. Yeah, you have to trade. Or it'll just ignore oh, yeah. it probably. Or it will try to make a guess and it will be wrong. Yeah, like there's like a threshold. Like it, it'll be like under thirty percent. That's like like an American quarter coin. is probably the same size <laughs> as Canadian quarter, and it'll a bigger, little bit bigger. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, what else can I do? Here? Let's see. <laughs> so. So. Um, yeah. <laughs> so that's the demo. So you're, you're free to come up and try it yourself as well. Um. So can we switch back to the presentation? Oh, if you guys want to watch a little bit more, <laughs> we're, we're here to entertain you. Okay, so lessons learned. This is what we were expecting to get some kind of knowledge out of these uh, POCs that we build. In TD, we always say we innovate with purpose. And one of the purpose of any experiment or any case study that we do is to learn something new and to educate the rest of the organization about our own learnings. So first amazing thing is that we were able to retrain the YOLO from recognizing cats and, and animals and cars, totally different and irrelevant set of objects, into recognizing six Canadian coins and ignoring cats and, and dogs. And we have done that, team has done that, without changing a single line of code. So that is the power of AI. Certain types of problems cannot be described with business rules. How do you describe how each coin looks? There is no business analyst in this world who has that kind of artistic skill to describe it. And there is no programmer who can actually code all of the if then else statements that model will be able to use. So in those situations when the rules are fuzzy or when they are changing fast, machine learning is potential answer to the problem. We're not saying that it will always be successful solution, but in most of the uh, cases, that is definitely uh, an answer, at least worth trying. And uh, fraud is basically a perfect example. Fraud, fraudsters innovate as well. They innovate probably more than we do. And they're trying to find all kinds of ways to trick our current rules-based engines to detect fraud with their manipulations. So we need to adjust and we need to have fraud engines that are also learning dynamically from the experience and readjusting their uh, parameters so that they are ready for the next transaction that will come down the pipe. However, AI requires a lot of data preparation, a lot of training, a lot of labeling. First of all, your data needs to be, I don't want to say in perfect condition, but it has to be in very good condition. Otherwise, you feed <coughs> the junk into the model, you'll get actually worse than you have expected at, as the output. What we got asked by, by our own management is, hey, this is cool. What, what do you guys think we can use this for? So there are, this is a game uh, at this point. However, there are some potentially useful use cases that we can take advantage of something like this uh, and potentially try to uh, package it into a nice uh, useful app. So we need definitely need to further improve the coin detection 
uh, accuracy, we need to add ability to recognize uh, bills, plus add US coins, maybe euro, like stuff like that, and bills as well. So potentially evolve demo into a mobile app for kids in schools to learn about the uh, you know, monetary values and stuff like that, play with it. And those kids actually also can provide us with the feedback loop. If the app makes the mistake, they can then tell us what it is and app can readjust itself in real time. We can also potentially, TD is big on ready commitment. We try to also serve the community, give to the community back a lot of uh, value. So we could potentially see if this can evolve, if it can get accurate enough to evolve into a app for visually impaired people when they get I know that we're all going to do toward the cashless society, but cash may still be around. So when at the cash cashier uh, point, you're blind and you get, they may have an iPad on top of that. And when cashier puts the money change back, Siri or Alexa on the device can be engaged and speak the total balance back. So blind person can actually be sure that he got the right change back. And uh, that's basically uh, another cool application that we were approached for is, oh, can you guys use this uh, model or whatever you built to recognize the counterfeit bills? We need thousands of examples of counterfeit bills to be able to train the model or use the inverse logic. Everything that's not recognized is a potentially counterfeit bill. So at least to help and do the sifting for whoever uh, bank tellers or, or Kijiji people. So you could potentially say, hey, I don't feel comfortable with this bill. So that's another application that could be uh, evolved from, from something like this. That's us today. If you guys have any questions, I don't know how many. Um, oh, we have 10 minutes. Do we have a mic, maybe? Oh, okay. So, sorry. Uh, I'm just wondering if you have any economic of scale for training in data. So, say, for example, right now, we already trained a model to look at coin. Yep. And then we said the next step is going to look at counterfeit shoe. But is there a benefit when we already have a model that identifies coin versus we have to build something from scratch to identify Oh, excellent question. We, we actually intentionally didn't look if there is something out there commercially available for, for this. We wanted to prove that something that was trained to do something else can be retrained with appropriate input and training data into completely different purpose. But I hear you, if we decide within TD Bank that we want to evolve, evolve this. We will probably not use this model. We will look into something that has already been trained for, for things like that and start from there, add more pictures. So I think we started here with 300 pictures. Then a new generation of co-ops came and Anthony said, oh, we need to do a little bit more, improve a little bit more accuracy. So we added couple of more hundred pictures of each mm -hmm. coin and limitations of this model are if you put coins one on top of another, if, if it's a pile, it'll get confused. It, it needs them cleanly separated from each other. They can actually touch each other, no problem. 
But if, if they start overlapping each other, then model will, will get confused because we didn't have enough time to train it in all those different conditions. However, if you are really adamant to, to train it professionally, you will then have to have a lot of, lot of pictures and train it. Hopefully, some pictures available on the internet. You can screen scrape and download and then use them as, as training samples. Any other question? Yep. Um, did you have any organizational challenges in, on your journey at all? Uh, in organizational challenges, in which sense? W was TD okay with us doing just, this? Just any sense, any, any kind of challenges that presented themselves organizationally. Um, I'm sure there were lots of technical challenges, but just anything else that you can think of, or was it just smooth sailing the whole way? Oh, uh, like technology challenges we had. Yeah. Organizational challenges we didn't have because whatever you had seen today was done on the side of people's desks. In, in their free time, on the weekend, and they, this, is, this is pure enthusiasm from this team. So we did not really impact any other project deliveries or anything like that. So nobody complained, everybody was very supportive. So that, that's interesting. So if you were to surmise about how to bring that across an enterprise, what challenges might present themselves now that you've, you've been through it? Uh, the challenges are really, I would say, around the business case for anything. So is there a really business, like something like this you can't charge for? And since machine learning and training of the model is laborious, highly laborious process, we need to make sure uh, the amount of time we invest, for example, for training it further, uh, will that give us high enough accuracy to be able to be used in professional setting. Right. For example, in the stores or you know, stuff like that. But to package it as a, as, a, as a school kids app, that'll be cool. I think current accuracy is more than adequate to do it. So for that, we will definitely have, we already have questions from senior executives Oh, can we do that? Can we do that? So I think there is a support. People are generally excited about what, uh, what they see. And sometimes they get genuinely surprised. Because you know, when we started doing this, uh, not many people actually believed. They were all laughing. Oh, you guys are taking coins, and we are payments, innovation, and we are cashless. We want to be cashless, but you know this is like a, just an example to prove the point and hypothesis. Okay, thank you. What's your next project? <laughs> Ooh, next project has nothing to do with with uh, AI. It is actually uh, something about. I'm not sure I can talk about it. Uh, it is. It is really. Uh, about international money transfers and things like that. Frictionless payments. That's, and whenever we can apply knowledge acquired from these experiments, uh, we will do that. So I, I will expand on the question from over there. Has any, any of your PUCs gone viral and got implemented at enterprise level? like a large-scale enterprise-grade implementation? You're leading one of the projects that is actually right now uh, one of the main projects in, in TD. So thank you for that question, Cameron. <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, we are very proud that we proved to TD that innovation, innovating with purpose is actually possible. Out of, I, I believe, 40 POCs that we had built in the last three and a half years, uh, eight ended up beyond POC either as production or uh, I think we have three in production 
we have uh, two that are major projects. Two, two were internal pilot, and one is moving into the pilot stage right now. So I think it's, it's a good story. And uh, that's why we keep getting funded. So that's, that's, that's encouraging. anything the work you did here I think is just images but yep. did you learn anything that's applicable to say fraud rules AI that way so when you're coming in and you that get is, transactions and that kind of thing that how is would you be able to do it next project hmm. I think we need to not 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 in terms of fraud detection that's not uh, our expertise there are other teams within TD yeah. who are basically uh, dealing with that and I I believe that they're already looking at neural network based solutions. Uh, what we will do as, a, as, as one of our future POCs, we're currently in the phase of scoping what that might be. What we want to do is we want to uh, achieve something called intelligent routing of the payment uh, instructions between different rails based on your previous transaction history and especially if you're a business, we want to make sure that bank gets out of the transaction optimal value and the client gets from the transaction optimal value. So those are, those are fuzzy rules. And they, they basically, uh, if I have like 20 rails and if client says, oh, I want the cheapest and I don't care about the timing, for, for money transfer, then you know that's a simple rule. If it says, oh, I want the fastest and I don't care about the price, that's a simple rule. Again, those are the boundary conditions. Everything in between can be fuzzy. What is the optimal? What is, what is the optimal for my case? So based on your transaction history, we can basically feed, may not be neural network, but it might be sort of like a, a regression type model we can tune parameters of that regression type model and it can tell us if the value of the transaction falls with, between these boundaries, do this and that kind of stuff. So to maximize the profit for the bank and also to maximize the value for the customer, minimize the fee or. Right, but um, I guess YOLO was that just like like a software that was already built because you just, you just took it and you just Correct. trained it yourself. That's right. <clears throat> for that next level there, <clears throat> would you be writing your own code or would you be looking for another model that's out already built and then you just have to just train it with those fuzzy we, logic? We have very, very strong uh, data team and uh, team of data scientists in, in TD. And there is also layer six that we had just acquired right. at the beginning of the, of the year. Uh, they're the ultimate experts. So we will be working with them to make sure that uh, they, they will definitely do the, the uh, model based on what we tell them we want to do, and then we will train it. Are we out, out of time? I think we're out of time. Thank you, guys. Thanks.